Good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Sullivan again with you for a Facebook Live. Tonight we're going to be talking about the non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is, of course, a brain disorder that neuropsychologists know a lot about. And what we tend to focus on are the non-motor symptoms. So that has to do with our cognition, our thinking, our processing speed, our retrieval, our memory, our word finding, but also our mood and our behavior. Those are the things that we really care about and why it's so important to have a neuropsychologist as part of your care team. So I'm gonna teach you all about Parkinson's disease tonight from my neuropsychological perspective. But to welcome you, I just wanted to remind everyone what the I Care For Your Brain program is all about. The idea behind the program is that brain health is multidimensional, that it's actually not just about your brain, that it has to be about your social health, your spiritual health, your active engagement with life. So my interest is in providing you with really high quality information and evidence-based recommendations that put you in the driver's seat of your own brain health or someone that you care about, so you're less likely to be taken advantage of by marketing ploys that are too good to be true and typically pretty expensive. So every Wednesday night at six o'clock, I come to you for about a half hour free lecture and I would love for you to help me spread the word. It's really important that people, everyday people, understand the brain on a scientific level and all too often we're getting our information from the media and from magazines and, and really that's not the best source. Many times those messages are sponsored and of course that brings their truthfulness into question but also you can't really understand things that are as complex as the brain in these short little brief snippets that we get in you know, the nightly news or in a commercial. So you really need to take the time to understand background concepts before you can get to the point of understanding any specific brain health disorder. So it is Parkinson's that we're gonna be talking about tonight, and this is a brain disorder that affects about 10 million people worldwide. What we think is that there are both genetic and environmental contributions, like there are in most dementias. So the idea is that most people with Parkinson's, or PD as we tend to call it, are born with a certain genetic predisposition to get this movement disorder but that there's something in the environment that turns on that gene. And that's the piece that scientists are spending so much money trying to figure out is what is it in the environment that turns on the gene. So in the case of Parkinson's disease, there's been a lot of theories, but I think the one that most scientists hold on to today is we don't know. And maybe pesticides, um, different types of defoliants or um, anti-rodent um, weed products maybe have something to do with it. So basically we haven't made that much progress in understanding the um, everyday component, but there's been a lot of really good work done on the genetic side, that's for sure. Now, like all dementias, if your genetics are so strong that you're going to get the disease no matter what, what you do in your lifestyle really doesn't matter. But what we're focusing on in this program are what we call modifiable risk factors for most forms of cognitive impairment, including Parkinson's disease with dementia. So it's really important that we understand what are the risk factors for all dementias, which we covered back in our very first lecture, if you wanna go back in the history and take a look at that one. But when we talk about Parkinson's, we have a young onset and a later onset, kind of similar to Alzheimer's disease. The young onset Parkinson's is considered to be under the age of 50. And if you're over the age of 50 when your symptoms start, then you're considered to have the older version. About two to 10% of people have the young onset Parkinson's. And it does have a different profile associated with it than the older onset. And that's a lot of information, really a talk for another day, but I do wanna just let you know, like most cognitive issues, the younger you are when you start to have the symptoms, the more likely it is to be more genetic. So what exactly is Parkinson's disease? Well, it is essentially related to 
cell death in a part of the brain that makes the neurotransmitter dopamine. And at first we used to think that this started in a part of the brain in the subcortical area called the basal ganglia, but recent research has actually suggested that it starts much earlier than that in the brain stem. And when we start to talk about the very earliest symptoms of Parkinson's disease, this actually makes sense. So one of the very first symptoms, and people can actually have this for years, prior to developing the symptoms that we commonly think of as PD, which is the tremor, the falling, the difficulty with balance and posture, people can have something called REM sleep disorder. And the idea is that this is essentially a disorder that happens in the brainstem. So typically when your brain is healthy and you go into the stage of REM sleep, you basically become paralyzed. That's that whole dreamlike state that you have where you're trying to run but you can't, you're trying to get your phone but you just can't get it. So you're actively dreaming, but the idea is that your body actually becomes somewhat paralyzed. The problem in REM sleep disorder is that this in inhibition doesn't happen and people actually act out their dreams. So when I'm interviewing people as a neuropsychologist, asking if people are acting out their dreams, if they're kicking, if they're punching, if they're acting like they're riding a bicycle, these are really important questions. Now this doesn't just happen in PD. Of course, we can see it in other types of brain disorder, but the idea of how it relates to PD is that this is something that many times patients will say, well, I've been told I've been doing that for 10 years and eight, nine, 10 years down the road, then they start to get the signs of tremor. So this kind of all led to some research that focused on what were these very, very first brain changes that happened. So the idea is that the cell death probably happens much earlier than it is that the symptom expression happens in the way that we typically think of PD with tremor. What we know is that this decrease in dopamine has a huge effect on the whole person. It's very easy to stereotype dopamine as just being a part of what helps us with movement and coordination and the use of connecting our brain to our muscles, but actually dopamine is related to all sorts of things. And most brain scientists would agree that it might be the most important neurotransmitter. You've probably also heard of serotonin, that is, um, of course, a sister chemical, and there's a very close interrelationship between dopamine and serotonin, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But dopamine does everything from making us interested in things. I'll often say to patients, you know, when I look at something in my office that I really love, like this beautiful lamp actually is a great example, I get this feeling inside my brain that just, oh gosh, I love that lamp. I love the color of that lamp. I love the shape of that lamp. That rush of emotion, of interest, of initiative in my brain and in my body is essentially an increase in the dopamine in my body. So when people have trouble with dopamine production, we're not just seeing it in terms of the coordination of our muscles and the end result being tremor. We're also seeing it in a lot of other ways that the brain behaves, and that's the focus of our, our time together tonight. So I wanna to talk to you about the motor symptoms specifically and go through each of those domains, but also talk about what we call the cognitive problems in PD, which are essentially retrieval-based problems. And what that means is the person knows darn well what it is they wanna say, but literally point A and point B are just not connecting. It's just taking longer. The information is in there, it's just slowed down. So one interesting um, rule of thumb in brain science is that there are three basic systems. We've got our physical system, our cognitive system, and our emotional system. And many times changes that you see in one of those symptoms actually plays itself out in similar ways across the other systems. So what do I mean by that with PD? Well, what we know happens to people with PD is they get slower, right? A lot of things, and that's the dopamine problem. There's just not a lot of rapid connection between brain cells that help with movement. Well, the same thing can happen in our thoughts, and thoughts can actually be somewhat slowed down. Our ability to learn new information, while it can remain completely intact in many people with Parkinson's, the process of acquiring new information is slower. We're slower to find our words. We're slower to swallow. We're slower to be able to project our voice outwards. So what happens in one system, you can think of as happening in the other. One of the 
awesome things about neuropsychology is that what happens in the cognitive and emotional system aren't apparent. They're kind of behind the scenes. So the detective work that we get to do as neuropsychologists is to unearth, to really get clear on what these problems are. And for many people, that can be a very satisfying assessment because they themselves know that there are changes in the way that they're behaving, the way that they're feeling, the way that their thoughts are working. But if you go to a typical doctor who doesn't have the tools to understand brain and behavior, you're gonna have to rely on your words to try to express to that doctor what exactly is happening. As neuropsychologists, we have really sophisticated tests, paper and pencil tests, that have been developed over decades and decades with thousands of patients that we rely on to get inside people's brains to understand much more clearly exactly what is going on. So our job is to really take all these different data points and bring them together to help someone understand their unique situation. And I think that that is just absolutely critical for people to not only get the best care that they possibly can, but to really feel understood by their providers, by their family, and also, of course, by themselves. We're also going to talk about some behavior changes that happen, like changes in sleep. Many people with Parkinson's disease can also have visual hallucinations that are important to understand because they're not the same that we see in psychotic disorders like schizophrenia, but they can be really scary for patients and families because they don't understand how they're related to the Parkinson's. So why don't we start off by just talking about the four main motor symptoms that we think about when we see patients with PD. The first one is resting tremor. So about 70% of people with Parkinson's disease have a slight tremor unilaterally in the beginning. So what I mean by that is that it starts on one side of the body and that's actually one of the specifics that brain scientists ask about when we're interviewing someone when we're not sure if it's PD or not is did these symptoms start on one side of the body or the other? Some tremors, some movement disorders start bilaterally, meaning on both hands or in both feet. And typically, very, very typically, that is not a Parkinson's disease specific issue. There are other disorders called Parkinson's plus syndromes that can sometimes have that type of presentation, but in Parkinson's, it's almost always coming to the person on one side of the body or the other. And in fact, the side of onset is something that's very interesting to brain researchers because we know that depending on what side of your body the PD started on, you have different cognitive symptoms, your adjustment to the disease is a little bit different, the, the length of time that you have PD is a little bit different, the emotional symptoms are a little bit different, your sleep symptoms are a little bit different, and that, that would actually be a great topic for a future lecture. But for today, we're just trying to go over some of the basics. So the idea is that the tremor is kind of like shaking, and really what you see is the tremor is most present when the person is at rest, so a resting tremor. If you are talking with the person, you might kind of see their hand go like this. If you ask them to reach out and say either take your glasses or take a pen, what you find is that the closer they get to the object, once they put the object in their hand, the tremor seems to go down a little bit. This can also be called a pill rolling tremor because you can sometimes see people going like this. The next motor symptom is bradykinesia, and this is a reduction in spontaneous movement. This is that slowness that we think about with PD. Just a little bit of, you know, we think of it kind of like a stillness that is, is not normal. We can also see this in a decrease in facial expressivity. Ex expressivity, yes, that word. Uh, it's late here in North Carolina. Um, but we call this a masked face, and sometimes you can see this in people with PD is that those fine motor movements, the facial muscles get stiff and tight, and it can sometimes be hard to understand what emotions the person with PD is going through because sometimes their face can look just very flat, very still. That is such an important thing to know when you're caring for people who have PD because it's very, it's almost unconscious that it feels somewhat difficult when you are interacting and having a social engagement because we're so unconsciously so used to getting subtle cues about people's thoughts and their feelings and sometimes you can feel like what is this disconnect I'm having with the person 
And that's why it's so important to ask the person the content of their thoughts and of their feelings. You cannot just rely on nonverbal behaviors in many people with PD because the disease just kind of can take over the expression of the face and so they're not going to have the same spontaneous movement as maybe they did prior to the PD. The third symptom is rigidity. So this is just stiffness, kind of inflexibility of the limbs, the neck, the trunk. You can kind of see it when someone's walking. They're very, very stiff, but they also tend to get a little bit of a stooped posture. And the last one is difficulty standing upright. So one of the ways we test this as brain doctors is when people come into our office, we are taking in all of their movements, the way that they greet us in the waiting room, the way that they get up from a chair. And you can see that that rising from a chair up to standing is really, really hard for people with PD. And that probably has something to do with how unsteady that they feel on their feet. What we sometimes do is have someone stand up in our clinic and just give them a very gentle little push backward. And with PD, what you find is that people kind of topple over really quick. They don't have that ability to kind of get back on their feet and modulate their posture one little teeny tiny bit and they kind of topple over. So those kind of, to uh, sorry, those kind of assessments are typically done by neurologists. That is not something that falls under a neuropsychologist typically. You have to have someone, of course, that's very well trained in doing those kind of things. We also have secondary motor symptoms, and what we think about with these are things like freezing, micrographia, which is handwriting getting a little bit smaller, and again, that masked-like face. So let me just tell you a little bit more about the first one, freezing. So this is basically significant hesitation that happens when the person is walking, and the feeling that they tell us they have is almost like my feet are glued to the floor. The lab that I was in at Boston University, the Vision and Cognition Lab, did a lot of really interesting, really important research on how people get unfrozen. And I learned so much from the wonderful group of people that I was in graduate school with. And they helped us understand that many people have freezing symptoms when they go through thresholds. So this can be a doorway, getting into an elevator. There's something visually that happens when the space gets enclosed that triggers the brain to kind of lock down and people have a really hard time getting going. What was fascinating to me are the tools that people can use to get unfrozen. And what many people do is actually rely on inner tempo or inner rhythm to get themselves going again. So kind of like a one and a two and a three. And on the third one, their body's able to move them forward. People also do things like travel with a laser pointer and put it down a few feet in front of them and there's something about that visual cue getting pulled to that stimulus that makes the brain want to go forward again. Many times freezing is a consequence of what we call on and off phenomenon in Parkinson's disease and what this means is that when the PD medications that are putting more dopamine back into the person's body and brain are working full blast, we are on. We have dopamine, we're doing pretty darn good, the symptoms are more minimal. When we have off phenomenon, what we get is that the medication, you can kind of think it like it's almost kind of run out, you're kind of petering out, you're running on empty, and we get a lot more of these kind of breakthrough symptoms when this happens. One unfortunate thing about PD is that the medications for PD actually don't have a great shelf life in the individual. So medications are gonna typically work a lot better at first than they do five, 10 years down the road. And many times what neurologists try to do is actually keep people from the medications until they really need them because we kind of know we've got this short shelf life. Hopefully with the invention of DBS, deep brain stimulation, which is putting electrodes into people's basal ganglia to help them stimulate the effect of dopamine, this uh, concern is becoming less and less over time, but it is something that people with PD know that they have to live with, and it's really unfortunate that that's the case. Micrographia simply means that people's handwriting gets a lot sl uh, smaller, and in fact, you can think of PD making almost everything smaller, right? So uh, body posture gets a little bit smaller, voice gets a little bit smaller, handwriting gets a little bit smaller, uh, 
you know, facial expressions gets a little bit smaller. Um, that's why the therapeutic approach called loud is so awesome because what they're sent, these are physical therapists, speech and language therapists who are using cognitive and physical training to help counteract the effects of PD. The whole idea is that they train people to make things really big because PD makes everything really small. So what we want to have is people actively compensating how to project their voice louder, how to make their steps wider, how to make their handwriting bigger. Everything about that therapy is saying bigger, bigger, bigger. And so the idea is that you're kind of pushing back against the smallness and hopefully coming up with a mid ground. Let's talk now about the cognitive symptoms. So really, like I said before, the main issue has to do with retrieval. And this can be an incredibly frustrating symptom because many people um, with PD, and, and this is actually a super interesting little factoid, is that I remember reading one study that high IQ was actually a risk factor for the development of Parkinson's. And many of us who work in brain science have this fondness for working with people with PD and, and we all kind of don't know how to put our finger on it, but there's something really engaging about um, the PD community. And if any of you work in it as a healthcare provider, I think you know what I mean. There's a lot of volunteering to be a part of research projects. There is a lot of community involvement, very actively seeking information. Um, but what that can mean in terms of these retrieval problems is that that can be really frustrating because when your whole life has been, you know, one of very quick cognitive ability, we just don't have the coping skills when things aren't working correctly. And it can be very, very frustrating when you're used to this, you know, when your brain's working great, it's kind of like magic. You just don't think about it. It just happens. Like, here I am. I'm saying all these words. They're coming out, you know, hopefully pretty decent. Um, I think that if I was sitting here really struggling to find my words, I would get really, really frustrated. And when that happens day in and day out, and it happens increasingly, that can be the source of a lot of stress. So what we also know happens with PD is that unfortunately about 15% of people over time can meet criteria for dementia. So what I want you to take away from that is not everyone who has Parkinson's disease has dementia. Many people can live with it for 15, 20 years and they might have the subtle cognitive symptoms but they don't have the frank dementia. I think most neuropsychologists would agree with me when I say that almost everyone who meets criteria for PD is going to have some mild cognitive symptoms. Now they can range from very, very mild to on formal testing. They might come out completely normal, but in everyday life, very commonly people will tell me about the word finding difficulties, trouble with coming up with concepts and ideas spontaneously. And the idea behind these cognitive symptoms from a brain perspective is that, remember I told you that there's this middle part of the brain that's having trouble producing dopamine. Well, that middle part of the brain, the basal ganglia, is made up of a few different structures. And those structures are on a big old circuit with the frontal lobes. And the frontal lobes are basically what are giving us these problems. So the way I talk to my patients about the frontal lobes is they're kind of like your gas pedal and your brake pedal. And it, depending on the, the brain, of course, very complicated, depending on where you're having the problem, you're either going to get too much gas pedal or too much brake pedal. And really, if we think about what the tremor is in PD, it's basically the gas pedal and the brake pedal are basically not able to uh, communicate effectively. There's difficulty once you get started, it's hard to stop. So you can see that in what we call a festering gait with people with PD is that once they start walking, it's sometimes hard for them to stop. But we also see a lot of initiation difficulties with PD and this can be misinterpreted as people being depressed or people not being interested in things. And certainly there is some apathy that goes along with PD and I'll give you some data on that in a little bit, but it can also be just an extension of the Parkinson's disease. So what we want to make sure we're doing is asking people with PD, how is it that you feel? Do you feel 
like you might have an intellectual interest, but the physical effort, the mental effort is just too hard. It's just biologically, you just don't have that spark. The gas pedal is not engaging. We can't make assumptions about people with PD. Remember, like I said, from the way that they look in their face, or by their behavior, we really, really have to ask people. I'd like to say that we should do that with all people with brain conditions, but maybe even more so with PD. So I talked to you a little bit about the retrieval issue and the processing speed issues. Um, again, like I said, these things happen because of the interconnection with the frontal lobes, which of course is related to the premature death of the cells. A neuropsychologist to me is absolutely critical to have a part of your care team. If you have Parkinson's or you know someone who does, I bet you have a neurologist, but I'm not sure that you have a neuropsychologist. So what I love for you to do is go online and if you put in find a board certified neuropsychologist, it will take you to the American Association of Clinical Neuropsychology and you can put in your state. You can put in your zip code and it will give you within 10 miles, within 50 miles, a board certified neuropsychologist that you should ask your primary care doctor or your neurologist to send you to. I don't care if you don't think you have cognitive symptoms, if you think maybe you or a loved one is at the point where you have dementia, a neuropsychologist can help you at any stage. Like I said, even if it's just to get a baseline to see how the change might happen in the future. We also really care about the adjustment that people have to brain health conditions. We're not strictly medical providers in the typical sense of the word. We genuinely care about people's mood and their family adjustment and their coping. So if you sometimes go to your medical doctor and feel after those appointments like you didn't get to say everything you wanna say or there's things that are really hurting your quality of life but you're actually not talking about them because you don't have enough time in the appointment or because the questions aren't asked, or maybe you actually bring it up and the person doesn't really take your lead and there's not a conversation, believe me, you would love to meet with a neuropsychologist because we're very happy to talk about all that stuff. That's what we love. Okay, uh, how about medication for any cognitive symptoms in PD? The only one that is FDA approved is called Exelon. Um, I am really uh, excited about something that we call therapeutic boxing, and there's a wonderful place close to me called Rocksteady Boxing, which my friend Dr. Laura Beck runs, and it's the best, most awesomest thing that I've seen in a long time. She posts great videos on Facebook and I get to see all sorts of people just in there kicking butt who live with PD and have difficulty with movement, but they're in there and they are building up their muscles, they're building up their brain, they're building community relationships, they're supporting each other and it just warms my heart. It's absolutely wonderful. Okay, so let's end by talking about the mood symptoms and the visual hallucinations and the sleep issues. So about 40 to 50% of people with PD either have depression, anxiety, or apathy. But there's two points I wanted to make about that. The first one is, is, is some of this just based on family report or observation of doctors? Remember, like I said, there's so many times where people may look like they're having a lack of interest or maybe they're depressed, but if you ask them about the content of their thoughts and feelings, it really doesn't match up. So that being said, we do know that there are biological reasons that people with PD have things like depression and anxiety. Dopamine, like I was saying before, is a very close sister to serotonin, which we, many of us know, is really related to our mood, but dopamine really is too. And if you didn't feel a certain interest, a certain spark, as excited and engaged with things in your life, I'm pretty sure I would become a little bit depressed too. So we do have biological reasons why these things happen, but there's also very real psychosocial reasons that mood changes happen, and that's related to living with a chronic medical condition and you not knowing are you one of those 15% who's maybe gonna go on to develop dementia. It has to be a cause of stress because life is more difficult. So there's probably kind of a squeeze on both sides for people who have PD. Depression can actually predate PD, and again, we think it's probably because some of those very, very early brain changes that we don't associate with tremor, but that are more associated with other parts of the brain that in the first place have a hard time making the dopamine, and that goes on to affect mood. 
Um, the next one we're going to talk about are visual hallucinations. These are really common in people with PD, whether or not you have dementia or not. About 50% of uh, people, according to most studies with PD, have a visual hallucination. It's very commonly associated with the medications that people take for PD. The risk factors are cognitive impairment, older age, a history of depression, and any kind of sleep disorder. It most commonly occurs at night, and very often um, these are of animals, of little people, um, insects, things crawling on the wall. We don't want to treat people for visual hallucinations with the same medications that we would treat people who had psychotic spectrum disorder. Many times people with PD are actually not distressed by their visual hallucinations. And that's an important point because sometimes the person that they're telling the visual hallucination to, they are getting disturbed. They think, oh my God, what is wrong with this person? I've heard of some people being brought to the emergency room because their family is afraid that they're going crazy. This is why education is so important in brain disorders because if we can normalize these things, then we're reducing the amount of interventions that we have to give, maybe somewhat unnecessarily. The next one we're gonna talk about is uh, loss of smell. That's a very common thing that happens in people with PD, which of course can affect quality of life. Uh, smelling and tasting are virtually interchangeable, so if that's the case, we really have to try our best to keep people's nutritional intake up. Orthostatic hypotension, which is basically trouble regulating our blood pressure when we stand up, especially kind of quick. So if you or someone you know has PD, you really have to focus on helping them get up in stages from a chair. You don't wanna just go from sitting to all the way standing in one fell swoop. You wanna kinda of take your time and pause at each one. Um, like I was saying before, we know that sleep disorders are fairly common in uh, Parkinson's disease. And what we typically uh, have happen is that we have disrupted sleep, um, either through some of those breakthrough symptoms, some of the off phenomenon, so tremor can come back in the middle of the night and that can disrupt sleep. Um, and we also know that many times people have that REM sleep disorder and so they're uh, actually waking themselves up because their body is moving around so much. Um, what I wanted to close with was talking about factors associated with well-being of people that have Parkinson's because at the end of the day, if you're watching this or you care about someone with PD, it's their well-being that you really care about, right? So like all of us, people with PD, of course, want a, a sense of control, a sense of um, knowing what they can expect, what their prognosis is, knowing that they have uh, as much ability to control their destiny and their future as possible. And I feel so strongly that education is the path to that goal, that I want you all to get online, attend conferences, go to support groups, go to these exercise groups. You have to, have to, have to be meeting with other people who have PD because otherwise you're gonna be reinventing the wheel on every problem and we don't want that. We need to know what other people have done to problem solve through their challenges so that way you can benefit from that expertise. Research suggests that um, helping people's caregivers is also a gateway to improving quality of life and that's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Probably something to talk about in a future lecture is the idea of mixed dementia. I'm actually a part of, I'm a recent member of a great Facebook group that is focused on folks with mixed dementia. And uh, many people will have some symptoms of Parkinson's disease, but might not have the full-blown disorder. Everything in life is on a spectrum, so it's not as easy as you do have PD or you don't have PD. There's a dementia called Lewy body dementia, for example, which is kind of a combo of Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. So sometimes the recommendations for Parkinson's might not seem like they apply to you or a loved one, but sometimes people can have symptoms of PD. And maybe as I've been doing these talks, some of that um, seems like it uh, matches up with somebody that you know. If you feel like you or someone you know is really struggling with PD, I really want to encourage uh, the use of counselors. It can be so important to have a place to express yourself and to be validated, but also have someone who understands the intersection between the biology of Parkinson's disease and the psychology of Parkinson's disease. 
What I'm going to talk about next time is actually another uh, movement disorder and it's actually the most common one called essential tremor. And this one is going out to a very special lady who is the grandmother of someone I love dearly who works for me here named Lauren Delgatti and her grandma requested that I do a little talk about essential tremor and I'm more than happy to do that. So if you tune in next Wednesday at six o'clock, that's what we're going to be talking about. Thank you guys so much. Please help me spread the word about this free brain health information. The idea is it's really meant to educate and to empower, especially if you know anyone with PD, please, please, please have them listen to our talk and do everything that they can to learn as much as possible about their condition. Thank you guys so much and I'll see you next Wednesday. Bye-bye.